Seven Studios was formed uh, with the idea of getting a group of people together that have worked together for a long time, that know each other really well, and they're all sort of passionate about gaming. We have veterans that have come out of major franchises and huge titles. Legion is best described as an action and a strategy game with elements of role playing. It's the story of King Arthur who watches his father, Uther Pendragon, die at the hands of his evil sister, Morgan Le Fay. Creating Camelot, uh, you know, getting Guinevere, uh, putting together his Knights of the Round Table, you know, spreading justice throughout the land and defeating his sister. You've got magic, you've got uh, swords, you've got armor, you've got blood on silver plate mail. It's a world that has lots of different elements, swordsmen, uh, archers, magic users, and the big sea catapult and siege engines uh, work really well in a strategy type of a setting. And we're really twisting that, and we're really kind of marrying action and strategy together in a new way that um, I think is going to come out of left field for most of the people, and I think they're going to really enjoy it. There's so much depth to the world because you're always, you know, meeting up with someone who you would really love to come fight with you. I think for me the most exciting part of Legion has to be the open-endedness of how missions are solved. Being able to use your swordsman, your archers, your catapult, your magic user together in a concerted effort uh, to take over the enemy, to take over this castle, uh, and to solve the problems that, uh, that exist that we've set up in, our, in the missions. You're not just fighting, you know, you are storming the castle and saving the princess. It's a sort of classic, fundamental gameplay. That's a challenge, I think, to, to have a game that's fun to play, not frustrating, uh, but allows the player a lot of latitude in how, how things are solved, how he gets through a mission. And we wanted to do a really classic fantasy, you know, combat epic that had, you know, giant armies and immense treasures and fabulous weapons. The development process starts with the idea and then fleshing out the idea, thinking it through constantly in my head. I just I had to play it and play it and replay it in my head to make sure I'm not missing anything, that there aren't any holes that we can't account for later. Well, the, the development process for Legion is, is highly collaborative. Uh, we actually, most of our meetings, we don't have set meetings. We meet mostly in the hall. One of the nice things about Seven Studios is that we all have a lot of experience. We've done this before. The development of the in-game art started way back with early concepts of Arthur and Lancelot and um, all the major characters. What my goal was in the beginning, and I think all the art team was really interested in doing, was, uh, was making this game look better. Art by far is our, is our top part of the game right now. It's beautiful. I just look at every other game out there, and I look at ours, and obviously certain styles of game are flashier or sci-fi or whatever, but for our genre, for any of the wilderness scenes or you know, snow, fire, rivers, anything that we're trying to do, we take it up 150% on the art and it's really paying off. It's just a day-to-day -day process of continually trying to push the envelope, uh, artists wanting more polys, the programmers uh, trying their best to give it, uh, the designers wanting more features, and the programmers trying their best to do it. I think what makes the game really is is the people that made the game because we are hardcore gamers. We, we love what we do. We took our gaming experience and we took a universe that we really loved and, and uh, were excited about and put them together. And then the thing I'm looking for the most is always my, my younger brothers. Whenever I do a game and they get to play it and they go, man, that is so cool. My brother's making games. That's the biggest reward I think I get. I think people are going to say, wow, that was a really great idea and we can't wait for more. Centuries ago, there lived a king who ruled over the whole of Britain, Uther Pendragon, one of the greatest leaders ever known to Europe. A forbidden fire grew in Uther's heart, for he had fallen in love with Egraine, the wife of the Duke of Cornwall. Fearing for his wife's safety, the Duke smuggled the beautiful Duchess off to a fortress far above the cliffs of Tintagel. Amassing his troops, the Duke positioned his armies at a nearby castle and awaited King Uther's inevitable attack. 
and the armies did indeed attack, but without Uther leading them. No, in fact, as the battle raged on, Uther had an even darker agenda than war. The king bade the wizard Merlin to call on his mystic powers to transform him into the mirror image of the duke. Reluctantly, Merlin granted this request, and Uther took on the form of his hated enemy and husband of his true love. However, before Uther could put his wicked plan into motion, the wizard gave him fair warning and told him that if a child was born from this union, that the infant must be given to him for safekeeping. Full with lust, Uther agreed. He then made his way into the fortress, wearing the face of the duke to where Igraine was kept and had his way with her. Mere hours later, Igraine's husband, the duke, was slain in battle. Not long after, Igraine married King Uther and became his queen, giving birth to a child. That child was Arthur. Keeping true to his word, Merlin arrived to collect the child, for with his gift of clairvoyance, the magician foresaw the grave danger that would face the child if he were to remain with his parents. Taking Arthur far to the north, Merlin left him in the care of Sir Ector, a man untouched by the news of the court with no knowledge of Arthur's origins. And with that, the son of the king began his life as a commoner. Years passed, and while Arthur grew unaware of his birthright, his natural father died at the hands of Morgan Le Fay, King Uther's own daughter. Before he died, he named Arthur the rightful king of Britain if he could be found. Since the boy could not be located, there was a great clamoring over who was to succeed Uther as king. Merlin knew that if Arthur were to take his father's throne, he would have to prove himself before the other knights. Again, using his great powers, Merlin thrust Uther's mighty sword Excalibur into a stone lying in a churchyard. Below it, he laid this inscription. Whoso pulleth out this sword of this stone shall be right king of England. The sword remained there for years, despite the best efforts of many an ambitious knight to remove it. As Arthur grew older, he found himself in the role of squire to Sir Ector's elder son, Kay. Since he was the second son, Arthur was not eligible for knighthood, but Kay was due to test at the annual tournament. On arriving, Arthur realized he had forgotten Kay's sword, an unforgivable offense for a squire. He rushed home to retrieve it, but could not find it anywhere. Panicked, Arthur spied the sword in the stone and drew it easily from its resting place. When Arthur returned to the tournament carrying Excalibur, Sir Ector was shocked. He went with Arthur back to the churchyard and asked him to remove the sword again. There, before the eyes of his adopted father and brother and all the knights from the tournament, Arthur replaced the sword and removed it again and again. Many of the knights pledged their allegiance immediately to this boy king. On Pentecost, Arthur took his rightful place at the throne which had once belonged to his father. And with that, a legendary adventure began.
Arthur. Arthur. Chaos reigns. The House of Pendragon is fallen. Morgan Le Fay, sorceress of the underworld, has taken up arms against her father, Uther, King of England. Morgan! Repent your evil arts! Accept a father's love! I don't want your love, father. I want your kingdom. Even in darkness, there is light.